Black Lives Matter is a movement that has received a lot of attention on this program and in the media. But there's a lot of what they say that has been being said by people in our political system for a very long time. One of those is our guest today. He's Congressman Keith Ellison. He was elected in 2006 to Congress from Minnesota, where he was not only the first Muslim American to sit in Congress, but the first African American in that state. Welcome to the program, Keith. Glad to have you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about this Black Lives Matter thing. Um, we were talking about it a bit before the cameras started rolling, but this is a, a new story being told in a, or an old story being told in a new way, I think. Yeah, it's very exciting. You know, I mean, the fact is, is that uh, young people, millennials, uh, are they were made, I think, certain kind of promises, you know, that we were going to end segregation, we were going to have this uh, post-racial America, and it was going to be opportunity. They were told that if they study hard, they can go to school. They were told things like this. And yet, you know, many of them are getting out of high school and finding themselves in a very tough job environment, in an environment where they got a lot of student debt, in a place where they're not, they're disrespected by law enforcement and other systems, and they're just not having it. You know, they're just not gonna just put, sit up with it. They're going to uh, organize themselves. They're gonna make a, a, a claim, and they're gonna and they're gonna push back, and that's what it is. You know, and it's interesting to me. You know, I says I, I'm a person who has children, 19 years old, 21 years old, 24 years old, 25 years old, and. They um, they resonate with the yeah. Black Lives Matter movement. They they think that it speaks for them. They spill. They I've learned a lot right uh, from what they're doing. And I remember uh, when I was that age, organizing rallies against police brutality. I absolutely did many, and that's where I cut my teeth in, in politics. And to see this uh, phenomenon going on uh, again, you know, in some ways, it's really hopeful because I'm like, you know, the the spirit you know, is not died. You know, right. people are fighting back. You know, young people are not apathetic. But in other ways, it's kind of like, wow, we're still here. Do you remember the moment when you decided to move from movement work and organizing rallies in the streets to entering politics? Yeah, I'm 52 years old. But before I was 33, I didn't really like or appreciate politicians at all. I, I believed in organizing. I thought that if you put pressure on the system, uh, the system will yield. You know, like politicians are fungible, you know. Uh, I, you know, the idea that, you know, politicians see the light when they feel the heat. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta bring the heat and then they'll see the light. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter who's in office. But, you know, uh, a combination of people I met and some realizations brought me to the conclusion that you must change the rules. Mm -hmm. And, the, and, you, and, and the, that means you have to change the city ordinance. That means you have to change the state law. That means you have to change the federal legislation or get some kind of an executive order. You've got to get your hands on the instrumentality of lawmaking and enforcement. And until you do that, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to sustain any of the gains that you might make. You know, at the end of the day, you know, our quintessential, you know, organizer, you know, Martin Luther King, knew that you needed a 1964 Civil Rights Act and a 65 Civil Rights Act and a 1968 fair housing law and, you know, you needed these things. Yeah. But how does that look to you now that you've served the time that you had, not just in local office, but in Congress? Well, I think that I was right when I made the decision that you have to change the rules, but I've never, ever let go of the idea that politicians cannot organize, mobilize, and educate the vast numbers of people that it is important to, to get emotion in order to create the environment where those rules can be changed. Mm -hmm. See, so like Nixon was no liberal, mm -hmm. but if you look at laws passed during his time, yeah. you got the EPA, you have civil rights law, you have some fair housing law. He didn't really want to do it, but he had to, because that was the political landscape. You have, say, like Bill Clinton, who probably wanted to do a lot of progressive things and did many, but he, well, we still got NAFTA. We mm -hmm. still got the 1996 tr crime bill, which expanded all these, you know, death penalties and stuff like that. Uh, and 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 that's because we were in a conservative political yeah. environment, right? Mm -hmm. So what could we do if we had some progressive politicians and a progressive movement all moving at the same time? I think we could remake this whole country, maybe this whole world. You know, particularly if we connect internationally. So how are we doing on creating that uh, two-sided pincer movement, movement and politics? 
I think we're doing well. I think we have a long way to go. But I think we're doing well. There's a lot of promising things happening. I mean, look, you know, uh, you know, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, uh, Bernie Sanders has been a contender in a presidential election. A person who is a self-described democratic socialist is like vying for the top office in the world in a very credible way with a well-funded 50-state campaign. And his opponent, Hillary Clinton, is declaring that she too is a progressive, which is awesome in my opinion. It means that, that, that the wave is heading in a certain kind of direction. And that, and that is good. And so I think that we're doing good. And, they, and then, you know, uh, black, we started with Black Lives Matter, these, these young folks that they're, they're protesting, they're making demands, they're growing. They started this campaign zero thing, which is beyond just marching in the street and it's sort of a program. And then so the Fight for 15, Good Jobs Nation, Domestic Workers Alliance, uh, all types of folks who are, you know, the, the immigration reform mm -hmm. movement is still rolling forward, and pushing at the, and demanding justice for people. So what will be different in this moment from eight years ago? I mean, we had a movement approach to Barack Obama's nomination also, and a lot of people said the same sorts of things that you're saying, that if nothing else, at least we'll have a residue of this organizing at the state level. Obama was genius in piecing together that coalition of existing grassroots groups, growing it, getting himself a nomination against the uh, establishment Democratic um, team. And then it kind of got demobilized once he got elected. Yeah. What happened with uh, or OFA or Obama for America, or Organizer for America, whatever it calls itself nowadays, uh, in my opinion, was um, it w the, the gains were not capitalized properly. But we're still so much better off. I mean, look, before Obama, with all the things that I would like to do to improve the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act, before Obama, we didn't have any kind of major step forward in healthcare reform in America. I mean, other countries must be looking at the United States like, are you people crazy? They are. You right, <laughs> you, you know, you, you mean you mean healthcare is so heavily commercialized that you let sick people die? Uh, yeah, if it's not paying me, they can die. Mm -hmm. And this is how we roll here in the United States, unfortunately. Be before the Affordable Care Act, it was so much worse. The leading reason for bankruptcy was medical debt. Mm -hmm. We also passed Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, which, mm -hmm. you know, made a stab forward uh, gender equity and pay. And, you know, we also passed the, uh, we did, made major strides forward in renewable and solar and renewable energy. Paris, you know, and we did some things mm -hmm. in climate. I mean, you know, we, we, a lot of good things have happened that are progressive in nature. Now, of course, um, the progressive movement has advanced, right? It's advanced so fast that Obama can barely keep up with it, you know? And again, I'm an Obama supporter, I'm very proud of the president, but there's no doubt that I vehemently disagree with him on his trade policy. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't disagree more, yeah. you know? You but, but, but the bottom line is, you gotta give him credit for moving us yeah. this far down and you know, the movement continues. With Raul Grijalva, you've co-chaired the Pro Congressional Progressive Caucus. Sure Just have. tell people a little bit what that is, how many members you have now, and then uh, we'll talk about this moment. So there's 435 members of Congress, 71 of them are members of the Progressive Caucus. What is a Progressive Caucus? It's the people who believe that we should prioritize diplomacy over war, that the average working American should have dignity, respect, and fair compensation, and should have the right to organize in a labor union that can bargain freely. We believe that retire, we, every American should retire in, 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 in dignity, and we shouldn't have our senior citizens living in poverty. We're the ones who, who, who believe that uh, uh, it's, it's a good thing mm -hmm. to make sure that whether you're black or you're gay or you're whatever religion you might be or you're female, that these things are not gonna limit your life chances. So we're gonna be fighting against discrimination of any kind. That's who basically we are. Everything you just described, all those principles and policies sound an awful lot more like the Bernie Sanders platform than the Hillary Clinton platform, at least. You talked about trade, she's changed her position, but at least her time- She came around, I'm glad about that. <laughs> uh, how many of you endorsed Sanders? Two of us, so far. So talk to me about that. Well, first of all, um, 
Hillary Clinton has been uh, a national figure since the early 90s. And I will be among the first to say that she's a person who loves her country and has fought to be a public servant and has maintained uh, her dignity under some very unfair and just unrelenting attacks. Uh, I do believe that she's not the progressive Bernie Sanders is. Mm. But I will say, you know, uh, in her favor that uh, you can be a progressive and support her, you know. Uh, certainly you can, and uh, maybe maybe we need some on that side to help pull her over. Mm -hmm. But um, but, uh, well, but I guess I, the, the point I'm, I'm I'm well, the point I'm really interested I, in is how point. do we move the needle? Yes. If even the likes of you in your cohort of seventy one, yeah, feel they have to go with the establishment candidate. She locked a lot of people in before Bernie ever got in, and then those same people. Um, are reluctant to just abandon her uh, after Bernie got in and started really showing well. Take us back to the campaign trail. You've been stumping all over for, for Bernie Sanders. Who do you see showing up? And to those who worry that he doesn't get race, does he get race? Does he get gender? Does he get this stuff in the way you want him to? Of course Bernie Sanders gets race. Bernie Sanders was, was the organizer for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the early 60s, back when his opponent was supporting Barry Goldwater. Now, I don't hold any, I don't hold that against Hillary Clinton. That's fine. Everybody should be, have a right to evolve in their thinking. But you asked me if Bernie Sanders gets race. Bernie Sanders has gotten race all his life. Bernie Sanders is, when, when Bernie Sanders has not, it doesn't just say Black Lives Matter. Bernie Sanders has a program for racial justice and empowerment. And every day, new African-American supporters are coming on board. Nina Turner, myself, Cornell West. We just got Ben Jealous just to, decided to support Former him. director of the NAACP. You know, the former director of the NAACP. Bernie Sanders gets race. And, um, you, know, you know, here's the reality. A lot of African-Americans just haven't heard about the senior senator from Vermont. Yeah. I mean, Vermont's a pretty white state. And, you know, Bernie's been there in the Senate for a few years and in the House, and they just haven't been exposed. I mean, but, but, but Hillary Clinton is a household name and has been for decades. How does it make you feel when you hear the language coming from Donald Trump around barring Muslims from entering the country? And what do you make of the response that's come from opinion shapers inside that Republican Party? Right. And his people running against him on the, on the Republican side of this nomination plan. You know, when I hear Donald Trump say that uh, no Muslims should be allowed into the country, I reflect on the fact that he said that Megyn Kelly uh, was asking him tough, tough questions because she was on her menstrual cycle. She uh, was bleeding. Exactly. Yeah, well, yeah, that's his exact words. Uh, uh, and I, re I remember when he said that Mexicans, the, Me the Mexicans are sending people and they're sending criminals and drugs and rapists. Right, and I think about how he went to a Jewish group and said, hey, we're, I'm a deal maker, you're a deal maker, we understand each other because you guys are all deal makers. And, you know what I mean? And said, I don't need your money, but I, those, my opponents are all taking your money. You know, I, I recognize dog whistle and overt discrimination and the thought I have is this, modern democratic uh, information age industrialized country is not immune from fascism. It's not. The only thing that's protecting us from fascism is our willingness to sacrifice for democracy. That's it. Some uh, charismatic, loud, boisterous, macho man who makes people think that what we need is a strong leader. Uh, and, uh, but all you gotta do for the low, low price of getting the strong leader, you just gotta give up all your rights. But don't worry, because if you're a white, Christian, male, uh, 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 straight, you know, you'll be all right, mm -hmm. and everybody else better watch it. I mean, we, this is what I think of when I see the rise of a Donald Trump and uh, Ted Cruz. I was going to say, is Ted Cruz categorically different? Ted Cruz is fundamentally the same. In fact, Ted Cruz, Ted Cruz says the only immigrants to come should be Christian. Donald Trump says no, no Muslims. Actually, Donald Trump is more inclusive than Ted Cruz. At least he lets in the Buddhists and <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> so, so the thing is, is that, um, yeah, they, they, are, they are the same. Here's the reality. 
there are literally millions and millions and millions of working class white Americans who have had their homes taken in foreclosure, who have had stagnant wages, who have who are worried about retirement and who are deeply disappointed that their ability to send their kids to college may not ever come true. And they're wondering why. And he is not saying, well, we have to have a fairer economy. We have to raise your wages. We have to have a more inclusive. We need more public investment in education and infrastructure. He's saying the Mexicans did it. The Muslims did it. Those did it. Those did it. And you should be mad at them. And to me, that is deception. That's lying. And it's profoundly immoral. And I'm really upset about it. Because <laughs> it does feel like a time often when the rhetoric gets so harsh that it takes us a while to recover. And the movement, the work that we're doing for longer term ends gets put a bit on the back burner. But think about this. You know, how often do you get to make a full-throated argument on behalf of your neighbors who you care about? It is an awesome privilege, you know, and I don't ever take it cheap. You know, it's tremendous. You know, you and I get to get to talk to our neighbors about what we care about the most. And sometimes we're discouraging them from bad things, and sometimes we're encouraging them toward good things. But we get to do it, and we got a platform to do it. I think we're pretty lucky, Laura Flanders. I think we're pretty lucky, too, and I think <laughs> I'm pretty lucky to have you come on the show. Right. Thanks, Keith. Great to have you. Anytime, anytime, anytime.